there's three basic elements that you can manipulate to swing faster. Number one is how much force you can create, so that's just how strong you are. You can get to a point where you're strong enough and getting much stronger than that is not going to necessarily translate to more club head speed. But if they don't deadlift at least one and a half times their body weight, they seem to have back pain. All the ones that deadlift over one and a half times body weight don't have back pain. The second one is then distance. So that's what most people call mobility in golf. So how far can he turn? We see this in senior golf. We lose the ability to turn as far, so we lose distance. As we get older, we tend to lose that mobility. Bryson, this would be the other piece for him, is, is he maintaining as much of that mobility as humanly possible? And then you have the final piece, and it's time, which is basically how quickly can you produce force and then turn it off. Those are the kind of the three things that he has to look at in terms of creating as much speed. Golf Smarter number 757. Your golf mind wants more power and distance, but is your body up to the task? With Chris Finn. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Chris. It's good to be here, Fred. I'm excited to, to get to chat with you today and, and uh, hopefully help some of the listeners. Well, I forget them. Let's help me. I just got an email from you guys. I did your assessment this morning <laughs> and got an email with a with the subject line "exploded time bomb." Uh oh. Gee, thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah. That's Glad right. to work with you. <laughs> we really try to break you down before we build you up. You know. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get into my aches and pains <laughs> in a little bit, especially you're asking me, you know, I did the assessment the day after I walked 18 holes and, um, and immediately this morning woke up going, I need new inserts for my shoes. <laughs> my feet are throbbing this morning. Do, and, and this is an aside, but I think you're a good person to ask. What do you feel about inserts in golf shoes? I think it, so. I think when it comes to footwear, this, you know, this is a rabbit hole. We could go a whole a whole episode on, but I think yeah, I think there's generally yeah. you know generally there's two types of shoes. Just to be simple, you have like super flexible shoes. So think of like your comfortable like Echoes kind of look like sneaker feel, right? And then you have your more That's what I'm wearing, yep, and then you have more your rigid shoes, which are like your classic foot joys. Um, so based right. on or my squares or your square, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so think of a uh, you know basically somebody who's got a really flat foot. So their like foot collapses all the way in. That's a foot that doesn't really have a lot of support. So uh, intrinsically, in the little muscles inside the foot are not doing what they're supposed to do. And then you're going to have the opposite end of that spectrum is some people have a very rigid or stiff foot where they have like extremely high arches, like their arch never even sniffs the ground. So generally with the, the role of footwear is the more rigid the foot is, you'll generally want to try to add more flexibility or try to help it be more mobile. So if you put a really rigid foot in a classic foot joy, that foot's ability to move throughout and have contact to the ground is going to be extremely limited. Um, if you put somebody who's in a very, who is like totally flat footed into, you know, a sneaker like shoe with no support at all, they're going to have, they're not going to have enough stability. So it's a matter of the goal of footwear is to kind of help you find the middle ground. So if somebody who's got a more high arch rigid foot, generally a less supportive shoe to a degree to try to kind of bring you to the middle. Um, somebody who's got a really flat foot or like the foot that collapses, generally a more rigid or supportive shoe is going to be what you're looking for. Um, but they've actually, they've done studies, um, a number of them, and actually depending on the type of footwear, and we've seen it here uh, at Par for Success, you can influence club head speed three to five miles an hour based on the type of footwear that somebody has on them. Um, basically by helping them be more in contact with the ground. Whoa. So, so it's a big, it's a big topic it, and, but that's to kind of a, a quick high level of just. Gen well, let's, generality. let's spend a couple yeah. more minutes on this because this is fascinating. Um, <laughs> par for success. We're talking about fitness, exercise, conditioning, correct? Yep. hundred percent. Yep. All right, good. So this is a good topic yep. then. So let's, let's spend a little more time on the shoes and your feet, uh, my feet. Um, so I don't have flat feet yep. and I don't have a super high arch. Yep. I think if I remember correctly, I pronate. Uh, so the back, back, so I, on the outside, back outside of my heels wear out a little faster. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that correct? Uh, well, okay, good guess. yeah, I mean, it depends how you strike. I mean, so generally the people will strike on the back outside of their heel. 
and then the weight okay. will transfer up to their big toe, kind of through the middle and up to the big toe. So if you're an over okay. pronator, that means that's more collapsing or more going towards the inside. A supinator is somebody more like high arch, like walks all on the outside of their shoe. Um, okay. So I'm going to take off my shoe. Yeah. Take a peek. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's worn pretty evenly on this one. Um, so, <laughs> okay, let's put that back on right now. Um, so then I, I do have a stiff shoe and I do have a soft shoe that I wear depending on, you know, Northern California, I got a lot of elevation change. Right, yeah. So depending on how tough the walk, I mean, I'm playing a flat course this weekend, but it's an eight and a half mile walk, yep. right? <laughs> yeah. Which I love, but my feet hurt at the end. Exactly. Of the um, so, and first thing this morning is like, okay, I need new inserts. Mm -hmm. These are, these are dead and they do die, right? The inserts don't last forever. They do. Yeah. And they'll, they'll wear down and obviously depending on the material that they're made out of, they may last longer or, or not quite as long, but that's where, um, foot joy and, uh, body track for a while that maybe two years ago, they tried, they initially did a launch, like a shoe fitting launch at the PGA show. Uh, maybe it was three mm -hmm. years ago. It was a while ago. Um, the program kind of has disappeared off the face of the planet, which it was a great idea. And maybe people just, they didn't have a, a good way to bring it to market. I don't know. But, um, mm -hmm. but basically you can get fit for shoes. And the goal of an insole would be, let's say you, you, know, you have a comfortable shoe that you really like, that's very flexible. You can kind of bend it in half. Um, but your foot needs a little bit more support. And then you could put in a, an insert in there that gives you just a little bit more support, but maybe not as much as if you went totally to a, you know, a classic, you know, dress shoe looking kind of foot, foot joy. So the insoles can be, that's how you kind of will can custom build the support to either build it up or take out support, um, you know, from the shoe. And when you look at it in terms of how somebody uses the ground in the golf swing, the type of footwear they have, like I've had some guys, they come in with a very rigid shoe and we look at their, you know, basically the, the pressure mapping and we look at their club head speed and their pressure mapping is ter terrible, meaning there's not a lot of contact to the ground because there's only like a couple points that are be just because they're so rigid and the shoe only lets them make contact. You've all had the really skinny high arching golf shoe that like only the ball of your foot and the heel touch. Um, yeah. and then you we basically would say, all right, let's take you out of that shoe. Let's just go barefoot. And even just going barefoot club head speed goes up two miles an hour. And you look at their pressure mapping and you're like, and it's like the whole foot's connected and you can see, you, you can call if it's going to be a draw or you can influence a cut based on weight shift and pressure and how you use the ground, we start getting into ground force reaction and all that. Um, so now the, so that's kind of a hint. Okay. That really rigid shoe, not ideal for performance for this person and probably not good for general walking. So that's where it's okay. We need to get you into something a little bit more flexible. And, um, so there's definite direct performance, uh, influences when it comes to having the proper footwear. Um, and, and then insoles come into play in terms of, based on what you're starting with as the shoe, if it's super unflexible and you need more stability or super flexible and you need more stability, or if it's really rigid and you want to take some, you know, take some of that rigidity out. Uh, usually you build from unstable to more stable. It's tough to take a really rigid shoe and, and make it less rigid, but, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's an important topic that really, it's not a sexy topic to talk about, but it, I mean, I think three miles an hour on your, on your club head speed, that's about 10 yards depending where you're playing. And I mean, that's, I think and everybody's I think looking cool. for 10 years. Yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, someone recently told me uh, that maybe it's not a good idea to have like, like th these memory foam inserts in shoes um, because you're just giving your feet bad habits in your back and your legs and your everything. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I think any insole, I mean, it's like a, like a brace, right? If you use a brace, let's, and we can use weightlifting brace, someone who puts a back brace on every time they go to the gym and they lift, basically you're training your muscles to only be as strong as they need to be with that brace. The brace takes some of the lift. So with an insole, you know, we talk about all the little feet in your muscles or the little muscles in your feet. If you have a very soft shoe, this is where in the running world, they went to very thick <laughs> shoes to try to dull the impact of the running to decrease shin splints and all that. Um, but what ended up mm. happening is the way that your feet react is based off the impulse into the ground. There has to be a nervous, like a, a neural reaction that the muscles actually turn on. 
And if you dampen it mm -hmm. too much, then the muscles don't turn on and that actually causes more problems. So that's when you saw then the, the movement to all the minimalist shoes, right? The toe shoes and all those sorts of things, right? It's kind of this pendulum that swings back and forth. Um, so, you know, basically shoes are very similar to that back brace in that if somebody's always wearing a super, super supportive shoe, the tons of like the muscles never have to do anything. Well, the, the one day that the guy who forgets the back brace goes to the gym and he tries to lift without the back brace, he's going to blow his back out because his muscles mm. aren't trained to lift without the extra support. And the same is true with your footwear. If you go from always having something super supportive to now all of a sudden you go, you always wear a super rigid golf shoe and all of a sudden you go total opposite on the spectrum and you go walk eight miles this weekend in that shoe when you've been used to wearing the other one, your feet are probably going to hurt like heck. <laughs> um, and, you know, depending on what your foot is, that may, you know, it may be good, it may not be, but, you know, taking away that much support and asking your, your foot and your lower leg to take all that extra load, um, generally an abrupt switch like that is not a good idea. Um, so I know that everybody's been is listening on this audio podcast, but you and I are looking at each other as we're having this conversation. And I, I I'm trying to report the faces that you were making. <laughs> you, were, you were telling me it's like you don't really you don't really want to do that. Yeah. You know, you know, it's not really a good idea. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to translate here with, with hand signals. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like Skechers, like Skechers are marketing all their shoes to adult, you know, seniors and adults, you know, look at the people they have marketing it, Joe Montana and Ringo Starr, yep. you know, guys like this. Uh, and they are all over on this memory foam inserts in their shoes mm -hmm. to give you a softer, lighter, you know, touch to the ground. Is that not helping seniors with their with their back pain, and or is it just kind of a band aid? Yeah, that, it's probably no? more of a band aid. Um, well, so I think there's a different. I mean, you always when you always look at it, there's there's marketing and then there's science, and it's kind of like somewhere in between, right? Some of what they're saying is going to yeah, be true, right. and that it's going to help some people. Uh, and footwear definitely can make a huge impact. On it. there's been a number of people, their entirety of their back pain comes because. They, their shoes stink. They're just not good. I mean, they don't have good foot mechanics. Um, yeah. But then there's other people who may have back pain who go buy soft shoes and it doesn't do a thing for them um, because maybe that mm -hmm. wasn't the actual cause of their back pain. So it's kind of what's one of the... Change your chair. Yeah, maybe it's the chair. <laughs> Change your chair. Yeah, yeah. So that was my biggest... Yeah, so it's just, it's just you know, it's, it's kind of a classic terrible answer of it depends. Um, sometimes it can be right. Sometimes it can't, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, when we just going back to performance on the golf course, having the right footwear can add significant speed to your golf swing. And, and just overall, when you're talking walking eight miles, like having the right support so that your foot mechanics are working the right way can make a world of difference in how you feel at the end of the round, too. Yeah, yeah. And how many shots I blow at the end of the round as I'm petering out here. Uh, let's take a quick time out and we'll be right back with uh, Chris Finn of Par for Success. When we did the interviews for Radio Baseball Cards back in 1987, we focused on stories you don't always hear on post-game interviews. On this week's episode of the Radio Baseball Cards podcast, we featured Jack Clark, who grew up in Los Angeles, and he tells us about his first game he ever played as a pro in front of family and friends. Here's another Radio Baseball Card. Growing up in Los Angeles, Jack Clark fantasized about the days that he could perform in front of his friends and family. Now he'd like to forget about it. I remember being in Dodger Stadium, couldn't wait to get there. Uh, Vince Skull is the announcer. I always, you know, growing up in L.A., my first game uh, playing right field for the Giants against the Dodgers. And That's the Radio Baseball Cards podcast. Short stories as told by the greatest baseball players of the 20th century with your host, the late Hall of Famer Don Drysdale. Radio Baseball Cards is free and available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Chris, you've been on the show multiple times, and uh, we, we've talked about a variety of, of things for golfers to get themselves into better golf shape. And that's really the focus of your work. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, it's. I think there's... Three things we like to, that most golfers that we help them with. Number one is going to be longevity in the game. So, you know, being able to play as long as people want, uh, you know, at a level that's enjoyable for them, right? So that 
hitting the ball 150 yards off the tee is not necessarily enjoyable for a lot of people. And that may be why some people stop playing. Um, so that kind of leads into, you know, speed and distance obviously is of a, a huge interest to a lot of people. And that's a big topic that, um, that we work on with a lot of people for that reason. And then kind of the third arm is, is obviously with our medical background is, is pain. Um, and I think the three of those kind of inter interweave each very nicely into everything that we, that we do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but you've, uh, come across, uh, a new way of doing things because every being, everyone's being forced to do things differently yep. now. <laughs> um, and it'll also allows you to expand your reach as far as the amount of people that you can help. Yeah. Correct? So, yeah. It's been really, I was really impressed with your little, uh, with your video, you know, your, your clips and how they work. Explain to me and everybody what exactly you're doing now and how you can help everyone all over the world. Yeah. So it, I say it was born from when I started, you know, in this industry, you know, eight, nine years ago, I didn't think it would work. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, this, is <laughs> baloney. this isn't going to work. And so just the way my brain works is I'm going to track everybody that we see. We're going to test them in the beginning. We're going to test them at the end and, you know, fast forward, you know, six years and we have a database of over, over 1300 golfers, um, between the age wow. of 10 and 80. So it's the biggest, and it's a longitudinal database, meaning like we're, let's say we're working, we test you today, Fred, you know, and in 12 weeks, we're going to retest you and see what we implemented, how it changed you. So we're actually getting change data, um, on that many people. And so that's, that's actually the biggest database in the world at this point, uh, looking at the physicality of how physical things impact golf and performance and pain from, from a golfing, uh, perspective. And so, you know, historically people had to, you know, we're in Raleigh, North Carolina and people would have to come here and we'd do it all with them and then they'd leave. Um, so, you know, with what we have basically have been able to boil it down to is with the help of technology and kind of logic trees and a little, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, basically saying, you know, based on how people perform on these digital assessments that we're able to do with them now, this, this is like what, what you went through and um, based on how, what you, if you pass or fail certain tests and how you respond, there's logic that's built in and says, all right, if you've passed this, but you fail this, then this is the next thing we need to look at. Or if you pass these three things, but you have pain, you're an exploded time bomb, right? <laughs> um, yes, I am. And so, so and that's and <laughs> all of that kind of what it's done for us, allowed us to do because of the, just the sheer amount of information we have is we're seeing these kind of categories of golfers of, of golfers are kind of falling into these couple of buckets that really, you know, this group needs a specific type of work and that really helps improve longevity, get rid of pain, help them, you know, helps them pick up speed. But if we did that, you know, from with group A, if we did the same thing with group B, group B would might get, would get worse. So group B needs different Mm -hmm. things. Um, And so that's where all of the research has really kind of culminated in understanding, Hey, based on how we do, you know, these couple simple tests with people, we can start to kind of categorize, and get to know you specifically as blueprint is not just a golfer, but a human, what age you are and what you need, and then give you, you know, what you need to get to where you want to go. Um, so it's allowed us to kind of scale the custom of the customizing programs for specifically for golfers to hit those, uh, hit those goals. It's been really, really fun to build. Do you work with pro golfers as well or? Yep. Yeah. We've got- I'm sure you work with PGA instructors, but I mean, tour, tour level. Golfers. Oh yeah. 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 We've got pros pretty much on every tour. Um, so Europe, wow. U S, um, uh, uh, so we do a lot with them with the remotes, this kind of remote or virtual, um, you know, work with them too. That's how we get a lot of like check-ins with them. Like we, these are the core things that we're, that we call them KPIs or the key performance indicators that actually translate to performance in golf, whether it's distance or, you know, pain, whatever flexibility, what, you know, just cause you're, you get your calf more flexible. Is that actually going to do anything to your golf swing? Um, you know, Probably not. And (laughs) probably not unless it's like a severe, terrible, you know, limitation. But if your hip can't internally rotate, you can't rotate through to your left side. Well, yeah, that's the number one predictor of low back pain. And that's going to, no wonder you hang back or you come over the top. (laughs) Like, so all of a sudden now there's these body swing connections that are evident. So there's specific ones that have huge impacts and will, you know, 75% of guys over the age of 50 fail at least one of the four big rotary centers. Um, that's just, that's the stat. So, so most golfers out there have a physical limitation Uh, that they're fighting against. I'm a stat. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I am, I'm an exploded stat. All right. And, and one of the first questions you ask is rotate uh, and they're, they're very simple. I mean, you give, you know, like a answer a or B, a or B. 
which is great. Maybe there's a C, right? <laughs> um, and you just do a couple of different things to assess various parts of your body. So let's go ahead and do the children's song, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees and toes, right? Because yeah. that's exactly what you're doing, right? And we're going to start with the head yeah. and the neck. And I just need to see, because I wasn't really clear, what, clear on it when I watched the video of you, um, rotate your head and touch your shoulder, please. Yes, Turn your head to yeah. the side and touch your shoulder. No, you're touching your nose to your shoulder, no, your chin. So wait. So, yes, okay. I get, so I, I get beyond my collarbone. And so that's why it looks like I'm going way down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I did this. Is that wrong? Did oh, I well, make it or no? It's a pass if you take Is out it? the cheating shoulder shrug. What cheating shoulder? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you can't see this. <laughs> What tree? <laughs> yeah. No, wait, did I cheat there? Am I cheating now? No that's, no, that's pretty good. Yeah, you're there. Oh, that is? All right, I said no. Yeah. I'm not exploding. <laughs> 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 so let's let's talk about that. The, the neck, just starting at the neck. Um, why do you need to be able to rotate your neck when you're swinging a golf club? Yeah, so it's, and the interesting thing with a lot of these is we have, in all, in all the assessments, we test both sides, and that's just from general health. We want to see symmetry both sides. But talking golf specifically, you know, for a right-handed player, right-handed neck rotate, you know, right-sided neck rotation really is, if you only go 10 degrees, that's not really going to limit your ability to swing the golf club. But going left, if you can't rotate towards your lead side, you think of when you take the club away and you can see me. So, you know, my, basically my chin is going to end up in my shoulder a little bit, right? So if you can't, if you can't rotate your neck to the left, you're going to have a very difficult time, A, keeping your eye on the ball. <laughs> um, and if you, you know, so let's say you get golf instruction that says, hey, keep your head down and don't let your head move and your neck doesn't rotate left, well, then you have to stand up and you're going to use your low back in order to try to compensate for that. Um, or, you know, but basically even without that instruction, if you can't keep your head here, you know, straight forward as you're rotating, right, that, that essentially, even though your trunk is what most people will say is moving, it requires cervical or, or neck rotation to the left to occur. You know, it's going to be right rotation for a left-handed player. Um, so if you're in, if you're unable to rotate your neck, there's going to be generally, you can see loss of posture. You stand up because you're trying to you know, get to certain positions where the, you're trying to get the club to certain positions. No one thinks about their neck. Um, and in most people, the neck is honestly the, the least common restriction that we see. Um, but it can, I've seen a number of, particularly people who've had multiple back surgeries, you know, th you know, in their mid back or low back, their neck doesn't move. And every, and you look at their actually surgically repaired areas and they move wonderfully because that's where everybody spent all the time working on it. And then they're mm. like, but I can't turn. So I need to work on the, and it's no, it's actually just your neck, man. <laughs> we just fix your neck. Everything else is already great. Um, so really, yeah, so it's. So these, when we talk about these tests, there's really, there's four main rotary centers that we use in golf. Neck is definitely, is the first one we look at in that, that set, that test. But most people, that's the least failed one, I would say, or le least impactful one if you do fail it. Okay. So I didn't fail it. I just wasn't sure what you were asking you me were, to do. I thought you literally wanted me to touch my chin to my shoulder. Yeah, you, were, like, you were close. How's that you, possible? You created yourself as we ask you to. We say, be ruthless. Uh, if it's close, <laughs> fail yourself. Because, and the reason we say that is, I always joke with people and they say, you know, we look at our percentiles of club head speed, which we've talked about on the show before. And Hey, your 50th percentile for your age group. And they're like, Oh man, that stinks. I'm like, yeah, but you failed all four, um, all four rotary areas. So that's a good thing. Cause you're, you have a lot of things we can fix. Your ceiling is actually really, really high. Uh, so the more you stink now, that means we have more room to get better. <laughs> Do some people have longer necks than others? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are people who just very short necks and it's really, it, it, it impedes their swing? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Just if, they're, if you're unable to rotate, it's going to impede things big time. Uh, but what about if you have a short neck? Is that is there oh, a thing or are necks basically? Length of neck won't really matter you know, because you know, they maybe have to go down less. Uh, yeah. But the, in terms of the rotation, oh. that's, the length of neck is not going to impact that. Ah, uh, okay. Um, oh, I have a question that I'm going to ask you right after this. So many people complain about, I lifted my head. I lifted my head. Did they lift their head or is it their back? And did they really lift their head? 
what, what, what is what does that mean from your perspective as a as a PT, right? Um, it just means, it means that they've, they've come, usually what they're referring to is they came out of posture, right? So they lifted up or they didn't stay down, quote unquote, in posture. Now, and that's the number a deficit or a fail in any of the four rotational centers. So the neck, the thoracic spine, the shoulders, or the hips. If you fail any of those, and seventy five percent of golfers over fifty do at least one of them. 50% actually fail too. Um, but if you fail at least one of those, you can't rotate. So you're not going to be able to rotate fully to get to where you're trying to get, you know, the quote unquote ideal position for your full, your full backswing um, or, or maybe getting all the way through the golf ball. So you only have, if you can't rotate, you, there's only two ways you're going to be able to compensate. And that's either going to be swaying and sliding. So a lot of lateral movement or up and down. So, so basically you, you lose the ability to rotate. There's only two other ways you're going to go and standing up or lifting their head up is one of the more common ones that we see big time for sure. Oh, okay. Um, as someone over 50, um, you said that half of us fail two of them. Yeah. Yep. And the other is, what's the other? Oh, so the, the what, are we, what are the two things that we fail? Oh, the two rotational centers. So two out of the four. Oh, I see. Yep. So half of guys over 50 fail 50% of the rotation rotational centers. Uh, and usually the most common, so like, as we said before, neck is the least common, uh, or least impactful. The two most common and most impactful areas that people fail are shoulder rotation and hip rotation. Uh, those are by far and away the, the two big, two biggies that, uh, that we find with people. Um, so let's move down. We, we, we did head shoulders now shoulders and we're not going to go to knees yet. <laughs> right. So where, where's the next stop that we're going on this? Yep. So the, um, so obviously you have the, the shoulder rotation was the 90, 90 test that, that you do kind of right. standing in golf posture and how far can you rotate your shoulder back? Um, uh, right. Yep. And so I'm rotating for you. Yep. It's pretty okay. good there. So then, and then Thank the, you. uh, the reason that's important is if you can't externally rotate or rotate your shoulder back, it's very difficult to get the club into the slot and on plane without a lot of side bend to the trail side. So then you oh. get a lot of back compensation. So um, having shoulder limitations a lot of times will lead to, you know, very arm dominant swings over the top, swinging across, you know, if you're a righty, you know, or basically outside to in club paths, um, you know, that are unwanted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, the shoulder definitely can impact back issues a, a ton. Uh, the back, the back, usually the reason why over 50% of golfers have back pain at some point in their careers is because the back ends up just being the ultimate good neighbor and trying to help out for all the other limitations that are there. And eventually it just gets overworked. Um, so then, yeah, then after the shoulders, then we go down to the thoracic spine. So that was when you're sitting in the chair and trying to rotate as far as you can. Um, and that a lot of times in, golf lingo, you know, watch, you know, watching any golf tournament on TV, you'll hear the announcers say, Oh, look at that shoulder turn. That's actually mm -hmm. the spine that's rotating. <laughs> uh, it's not the shoulders. It's not the shoulders. No. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and then the fourth obviously is then the hip and we look at specifically what's called internal rotation. So, uh, if you're rotating into your air internal rotation haps on the trail happens on the trail leg when you're taking the club back and it happens on the lead leg when you're going, you know, following through getting through impact. Uh, I, it, my back pain has always been lower back pain mm -hmm. when I have it. Um, pretty good shape. Now I've been doing yoga on and off, uh, since my early twenties. Yep. Um, and also I've had many, um, masseuse massages and, and some physical therapy. And they're like, you're Gumby. It's like, Oh my God, you're really flexible. And I always have been pretty flexible. Mm -hmm which is probably to my advantage, but, um, the back pain for me has always been on the lower side and I was able to, um, really, once I learned to stop the sway, a lot of that back pain disappeared, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, can back pain for golfers find it its way in any multiple parts of your back or is it really uh, centralized down at your lower back? No, it can be anywhere. So you can have back pain in the, the most common area people get it will be their trail trail side. So if you're a right-handed player, their right low back pain is going to be the most common area that people get it. Um, yep. But you, know, you can also get left-sided or central or across the whole low back. 
Um, and obviously there's different types of back pain, whether it's muscular or it's you know, nerve or disc. Those are very different types of back pain, but usually just the kind of the general soreness after the round that kind of you work, you're able to work it out. That's the most common we see is actually, uh, is muscular pain. And it actually usually comes from the hip musculature locking down. Um, again, not a, most back pain is not a back problem. Uh, it's usually just the back is where we see the symptom of, of the pain. Okay. Hmm. 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 Um, you know, one of the things that on your website, you talk about dedicated driven golfers. Uh, I understand the point, but why is, why do you focus there, uh, for the work that you do? Yeah, well, I think it's because people who are looking for a quick fix or just want to go buy the next new, new, new driver to pick up the yardage or, yeah, those are not people who do well typically when, <laughs> with, uh, taking, you know, 90 minutes a week, you know, maybe 30 minutes, three days a week to actually work on their bodies and, and do the things that long term are going to make the impact, you know, where we have success with people or golfers or just generally active people who are willing to put in, you know, it's not a ton of time, literally 90 minutes a week is what we find is kind of, if you can put at least that much time in, uh, and you're doing the right stuff, that's, you can see pretty awesome results. But, um, you know, if you're not willing to do at least that, uh, I can't help you. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I can show you all, I can give you all the data. I can show you all the exercises, but if you're not going to do the simple, you know, 15 minutes a day, um, like I can write the greatest program in the world, but if you don't do it, it's not a very good program. Um, sure. so, so yeah, so that's, that's so, why we look for that type of a, of a, of a person. Who's really driven to get their index down to be more competitive and even just to, um, or just to kick father time's butt right like hey i want to <laughs> i want to be playing when i'm 80 i want to play when i'm 85 right. like um like it's not it, i want to shoot below 80 when i'm 80 exactly yeah. right so it's not necessarily like competitive i'm playing amateur level events or professional i want to play on the champions tour when i turn 50 it's not necessarily that it's a lot of times like i just want to play the member guest with my son and i want to be able to play three days in a row without being laid up you know, for the next week. Um, you know, so it's people who are motivated to do things that's in, in success and what's meaningful to every golfer is different. Uh, maybe it's going to Ireland and playing, you know, 36 a day for 10 days in a row. Like, like maybe that's what uh, it looks like. Right. So yeah, that, that sounds painful. <laughs> yeah. That sounds really painful. Uh, <laughs> but so it's just, so that's what, you know, driven or dedicated is going to have different meanings to different people, but it basically just means, are you willing to, to do what you need to do to keep yourself healthy and, and achieve what you're looking to achieve. I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here because yeah. you, you, you really kind of led me, led me into this and I even had this written down, but are there, um, let's call them training aids that are out there that claim to help you correct physical issues that aren't telling the truth from your perspective? I wouldn't say that there are training aids that are like flat out lying. Um, okay. I, I think that are making claims that you won't buy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there are definitely training aids that can hurt you um, if you're using them in a position where you shouldn't be using them. So, um, speed training aids are come to mind right off the bat of because that's that's the sexy thing, right? Get this speed device or this speed yeah. system, or everybody wants speed. Take off your shoes, yeah. get more speed. Exactly, right? <laughs> okay, just go buy new shoes. I'm going to go do that. Um, <laughs> so, and, and I think this is where the 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 assessment comes in and kind of figuring out what category somebody's in. I mentioned earlier, depending which kind of bucket you fall into, certain training aids or systems are going to more than likely hurt you. So for instance, if you fail any of those rotational centers and you go pick up a speed training device and you start swinging a bunch of times as fast as you can, you're just basically swinging, you're just moving, you're driving a car really fast into a brick wall without brakes because you don't have the mobility to get all there, all the way there. So you, you, you buy a brand new Porsche and you take the brakes out, you can go hundred miles an hour. That's great, but good luck stopping. <laughs> Uh, you know, and that's, and that's where we see a lot of people who get hurt or, you know, we talk about, we, we affectionately call people who, who fail, you know, some of the mobility centers is our ticking time bombs. And that it's not so that they're definitely going to get hurt, but somebody who has those sorts of limitations and tries to go really, really fast without making sure they have the mobility to get from point A to point B. Um, or we see this a lot of times with, you know, very, you know, say 12 or less handicaps 
where physically they're, you know, technically when we look at speed, there's kind of, you can get speed from the right equipment. You can get speed from good technique. And if generally, if you're a better golfer, that's, you're going to get a lot of your speed because those are optimized or as efficient as possible. But then as you age, if the other two pieces of the pie are mobility and strength or power production. Uh, and so a lot of times we see very skilled golfers swinging faster percentile wise. This is what we see from our data. They may be swinging in the 60th percentile for people their age, but when we look at their mobility, they fail one or two mobility centers and their power numbers are only in the 20th percentile. So their engine's only designed to support, let's say 90 miles an hour, and they're already swinging 95. So they're already swinging faster than what their body can handle. And now they go by mm. and they're like, I want to hit a hundred. So they go by the latest swing speed training device. Right. And now, well, now all of a sudden we're creating even a bigger gap between what their body can handle and how fast they're going because the nervous system is cool and it, you can pick up, you know, a certain number of miles an hour above and beyond where you're at. But now you've just widened your injury gap. And that's every single person mm. that we've seen gotten that's been hurt with some sort of speed training device. Every single one. So over, we did a study, it was a little over 50 of them. Every single one of them fell into that category. Either they were already swinging faster than they could handle or they failed or, and, or they failed one of those rotational centers. So it was like, it was across the board, no exceptions. <laughs> People who, that's why we call it the, uh, the ticking time bomb. And we say like an exploded time bomb is somebody who is swinging faster than what they can handle and, or fails one of those, uh, you know, those mobility areas, but is already has pain. <laughs> So it's like too late. You're not ticking anymore. The time's up. You've, you you we've got a pain issue that we need to address. Um, and so like, so that person definitely shouldn't be doing speed training. Um, that person should be getting healthy, fix, you know, step one, get the rid of the pain, get healthy, you know, fixed tissue, whatever needs to be done. Step two, make sure mobility is clean, get your strength up so you can actually support it. And then there's this other group of people. We, I, we always call them the more RPM under the hood golfers where, their power numbers are like 90th percentile, but they aren't transferring it to golf. They're maybe only swinging in the 20th percentile for their age. And so those are the big testimonials that you see on Instagram or social media where it's like, yeah, I, pay, I did this, this speed training device. And in 10 minutes, my clubhead speed was up 10 miles an hour. And unfortunately, that's less than 5% of golfers. But the other 95% think that that includes them. <laughs> and then they end up getting hurt. Um, Right. So, so no, I mean, to go back to your question, it's a long winded way of saying, I don't think that any training device is necessarily bad. I think there are a lot that trump up the one positive thing that the training aid can potentially do for you. And I don't know of any that actually warn golfers and say, Hey, before you do this, these are the things that you should check off that you're able to do to, before you can safely use our system. That's my biggest pet peeve with kind of training aid companies or whatnot is that there's a lack of information out there. And part of that's on us as, as in the medical and fitness field. And that's one of our goals at Par for Success is to give golfers a very clear path to say, Hey, that's where you want to go. Let's see where you're at and let's build you a very clear path to where you want to go. And that's kind of the, the hope of what the assessment and making it where people don't have to come to Riley to do it. They can do it from sitting in their living room uh, and start to figure out what is the best path for them to go. And for some, it may be just get a speed training system and because you're a more RPM under the hood person and that's all you need. I've, we've had guys jump 20 miles an hour in 10 minutes here, but you know, they jump 40 inches out of the gym. They're six, seven, but their club hit in their, in their thirties and their club head speeds like barely a hundred miles an hour. Their mobility is great, but they just don't know how to create power in the golf swing. Mm -hmm. So that's somebody like give them some speed training and boom, Hey, now you're from 100 to 120. Like amazing. Right. But that's like literally one out of a thousand people that we've had come in. Uh, but if you don't test, you don't know. I can't believe that uh, one of the things that I wrote down that I can now check off the list is pet peeves. Yeah. <laughs> you actually said it. Yeah. You actually said it. Uh, we're going to take one more time out and then want to come back and talk about the assessment. But I have a, a question that seems to be on everybody's mind these days. And we'll get that right after this. Golf course architecture is not the sexiest of golf topics to focus on in a podcast, but once you understand how courses are designed, you have a greater understanding of how to take advantage of course management in your game. 
Our guest this week on Golf Smarter Mulligans is Trip Davis, who provides a unique perspective on playing strategy that most recreational golfers do not consider. Broadly speaking, the UK has two different styles of golf courses. They have the link style golf courses, and then they have inland courses. Inland courses can also play hard and fast. Heathland style golf courses in the UK are very similar to Lynx courses in that they're usually on sand, usually exposed to the wind, but they don't have the relationship to the sea like the Lynx courses do. The biggest difference that an American golfer would notice in going over there versus playing here is the condition of the golf courses. Golf courses over there are not maintained near to the level that the perception of quality is here. We call that the Augusta National Effect. In the United States, everything is manicured to the extreme. In the UK, they're more concerned about playability and strategy and keeping the golf course in a condition that allows the golf course to play the way you wanted it to. That's episode 73 of Golf Smarter Mulligans, featuring golf course architect Trip Davis, being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are free and available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and receive brand new episodes of each automatically when they become available. Bryson DeChambeau. He seems to be uh, on uh, the top of everybody's list to discuss. Um, I want to take a little time travel with you right now. He's 26 years old. Let's move up till nine years. He's 35 years old. Is what he's doing now, is he going to be able to continue that? Or by the time as he's 35, he is long gone from the tour because his body has just exploded on him. What do you think is going on there? It's a great question. Um, I, I think what we're seeing in the game of big picture of the game of, of golf is it's it's become a power sport. Uh, and the purest expression of power in golf is club head speed. And there's direct relationships. I'm sure everybody's seen the, the charts of the further you drive it. There's a direct relationship between that and how much money you can make on tour. Um, you know, some of the guys that are at the top of putting are losing their cards. Like, so I think there's been a shift you know, from a statistical standpoint and say, Hey, if I can hit it further, I'm going to make more money. Um, now when we look at just the basic science of it, um, it's a simple, very simple equation of power equals the amount of force you can produce times the distance over which you're creating it divided by time. So D divided by T. So basically what that means is there's three basic elements that you can manipulate to swing faster. Number one is how much force you can create. So that's just how strong you are. Um, now there is what we're finding a lot of our research. There's, there's a, a return, a, a diminishing, a point of diminishing returns on that, where you can get to a point where you're strong enough and getting much stronger than that is not going to necessarily translate to more club head speed. Um, so if we look at what Bryson's been doing, what a lot of the guys on tour and girls on the LPGA tour have been doing, um, you know, we've got girls here swinging 105, 106 miles an hour. We had one of, you know, so like in high school and college, <laughs> but every single one of them deadlift over 200 pounds. Like, so wow. there's, there's a dirt, but if they don't deadlift at least one and a half times their body weight, they seem to have a lot, they seem to actually have, they seem to have back pain. Um, all the ones that deadlift over one and a half times body weight don't have back pain. So when we look at Bryson and we look at, that's kind of step one is making sure he's strong enough to support when we, we're talking about how fast is he swinging is he strong enough or is his body able to actually support what he's producing in terms of speed? The second one is then distance. So that's, that's most people call mobility in golf, right? So how far can he turn? So the more, you know, we see this in senior golf, we lose the ability to turn as far. So we lose distance. I always, use, I, like, I always like the analogy of an on-ramp getting on a, you know, onto a highway and you have a, a Tesla versus an 18 wheeler. Right. Tesla floors it there. They don't need as far to go to get to 60 miles an hour. Um, but your senior golfer needs a longer on ramp to get to. They may still be able to get to 60 miles an hour, but they're going to need a longer time to get there. Um, so the tortoise and the hare, it, classic it, tortoise and the hare. Right? Exactly. So when we as we get older, we tend to lose that mobility. Bryson, this would be the other piece for him is, is he maintaining as much of that mobility as humanly possible? To, at age 35, he should have no issue maintaining that, assuming he's doing what he's the right stuff. Um, and then you have the, the final piece, and this is where all the speed training devices and everything, and it's time, uh, the science term is called an, the impulse, which is basically how quickly can you produce force and then turn it off? 
Um, so if you have a very slow on ramp, that's not somebody who's going to be very punchy and, and fast uh, and real explosive. Somebody who can create a very explosive uh, degree of power. So those are the kind of the three things uh, that, that he has to look at in terms of creating as much speed. So what he's doing in terms of putting on lo- like weight, basically, <laughs> is think of that as armor. Um, so if you have Justin Thomas and Bryson both swinging, let's say they both go out and they swing 130 miles an hour. Well, that, I don't know. JT is probably 150 pounds ish, 160 pounds. You got somebody or think of like Ernie Els, right? Like, like a big guy with a lot of load or a lot of weight. It's going to take less relative energy for the bigger person to create that amount of force and that amount of power than it would for the smaller person. So in theory, the bigger somebody is, the more durable they would be over the course of a season uh, and over the course of a lifetime. So that's where you look at guys like Rory and JT, like these smaller frames that swing crazy fast. Yeah, you, you do have serious concerns about their longevity in the game and that sort of a thing. You look at like a John Daly, like guy's got a lot of weight. He's lasted forever, <laughs> right? Um, so there's 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 examples in baseball pitchers you know who've lost a ton of weight and then all of a sudden they start getting hurt they put the weight back on and now they're fine again like so there definitely is something to having now what's the magic amount of weight and is it good weight versus is it bad weight you know those are all other nuanced discussions but you know in my opinion from a science perspective it seemed from the outside looking in without knowing the details and the nuances it seems like he's addressing the three big areas which are getting stronger you know, de- making sure he's got the mobility to create and, you know, break. <laughs> Once he gets going 130, does he have the ability to slow it down? Uh, and then, you know, training to make sure it's done as efficiently as possible from a nervous system standpoint. And having more weight gives you, you know, better relative, you know, you know, if me and you go sprinting and we can both run 10 miles an hour, but you can do it at 60% of energy expenditure and I have to do 100% of en- energy expenditure, you're going to be able to run that pace a lot longer than I will. And that's essentially what Bryson's trying to do. Hmm. And plus, he's he's changed the way he rotates through. Well, I think that's his yeah, club thing. swing. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'll see his feet. Yeah. He rotate. It seems like he rotates on his heels yeah. to get out of the way. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's the other thing. He's made a ton of technical changes too, and that's. I don't know if people are. Talking. He's all about technical. Yeah, and I don't know if a lot of people are talking. As many people are like, it's not as visible in front of your face. Like, look how big he's drinking seven shakes and eating five thousand calories a day, right? Like that. The technical changes aren't as like massive, different, new, um, but he's made a ton of technical changes too, and adding lag and, and to, to increase the speed and how he, you know, planes that he's taking and, and whatnot too. So he's, if we talk about the four quadrants of speed, he's addressed, he's addressing equipment, he's addressing technique, he's addressing mobility and he's addressing the, his power output. Um, so, I mean, as I think people call him the scientist, I mean, he's doing it from a very scientific standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why he's playing single length irons too. All right, let's talk. Let's talk about your um, your online yeah. assessment that you're doing these days. I know you've been waiting. You've been very patient with me. I appreciate it. But this is why you wanted to you wanted to reach out to me and get back on the show uh, because you wanted to talk about this online assessment. Please do. Yeah, and it's really it's a it's a great way for people. Like I said, they don't have to come to Raleigh. They can literally you just need a chair, <laughs> and you can do it from wherever you are. You know, you're your bedroom, your, your kitchen, do it at work. If you, know, if you don't feel like working, take a break and do the assessment. Uh, you know, it literally takes five minutes, does not take very long. And the goal is at the end that we're able to say, Hey, you had mobility limitations or you didn't, um, you know, are you, are you having pain? Are you not? And kind of then at the end, our, our goal is then we deliver, we'll send you over kind of some ideas of things as based on what category you come out as things that you should be doing or looking at things that you should definitely probably more, more importantly be avoiding, <laughs> um, that potentially would be negative, you know, negatively impactful to you. And then, um, you know, and then, you know, so th- that's kind of the, the, the big goal of the assessment from that standpoint. And how, um, once you take the assessment, tell me what the program is that you can sign up for. Yeah, at, sure. At so, parforsuccess.com. Yeah. So everybody who does the assessment will, we send you all the, uh, you know, basically the, what you should do, shouldn't do based on what category you get to. And then if, if there is interest in, and kind of actually addressing the issues that, that you find, <laughs> uh, I mean, we have a, a really, really good virtual program. Every custom build everything for you, um, starting with based on kind of what category you in, you're in. And then we kind of, you know, how many days a week are, is realistic? What equipment do you have? And, um, so from there, it's basically you have the option. If you're, if you're interested to read more about it or learn more about the program, 
uh, I definitely would encourage you to do so. You, you work directly one-on-one with our coaches. You know, you'd have your own specific golf performance coach here at Par for Success in Raleigh and um, you know, basically work with you. A lot of people, you know, whether you're working in your home because you, you're not going to the gym, if you're going to a gym and you have a bunch of equipment there, or maybe you have a great home gym or wherever it is, whatever equipment you do or don't have, uh, you know, we work with people all over the world at this point, and uh, it really it's been fun to see that we get are getting the same results with our people that we work virtually uh, as we do with our people that we work with in house. And that starts with assessing and and kind of reassessing and making sure that everything that people are doing is specific to them and what they need. And you know, the cool thing is to like I can guarantee we guarantee everybody that if you know you do what we ask you to do in the first ten to twelve weeks, you're going to gain on average we see ten yards. Uh, that's the average. And that's, uh, I always joke, the worse you are in the beginning, you're probably going to beat that average. <laughs> so, so just like with you with the neck, like if you're not sure mark it as a fail, cause we'll make sure that it gets to be a very clear and easy, definite pass. <laughs> and how long, uh, the program is how long, uh, three months? Well, we've had people who've been working with us start. for three years, so <laughs> you can, you can oh, go okay. as long as they'd like. We start everybody. We, uh, we, we do require that you, if you're going to do it, if, for it to be worth your time and for, you know, for us to, we, like I said, we guarantee everything we do. We do require 12 weeks to start. So it's an initial three month plan. And from there you can, people can go month to month. They can, most people usually will just say, Hey, let's do a, a minute for the long haul. And that's where we're looking for that driven golfer. Who's not looking for the quick fix. They're, they're looking for right. something that's going to be with them and help them play better into their sixties, seventies, eighties, uh, you know, and beyond. And so you don't need your own local coach to go and work on this stuff with, right? No. How, you guys, you guys, you are the coach because virtual online stuff, um, video conversation. Oh yeah. 100%. And they can watch you do, they can watch you do it. Yeah. And they have live, they, we, awesome. we give live video feedback in terms of form and technique. Um, you know, we don't do the actual swing coach, swing coaching side of things. That's where if somebody has a swing coach, uh, you know, locally, you know, we'll always interface with them and, and see kind of, Hey, physically, this is what's going on with, with Joe. And, um, you know, what are you guys trying to achieve from a technical standpoint? Let's make sure we support that from the, the fitness and physical side of things. So, um, so yeah, it's, we do it. And what's the cost of the program? Yeah. So we're doing, uh, yeah. So it's the standard cost for the initial three months is four fifty includes, you know, everything. And then, um, but like we said, if, uh, going through, um, we have, you'll, I think you'll say, you'll put the link down in the notes and, and basically from there, Mm -hmm. If they, they were ready to go, they can actually get 50 bucks off. Just, you know, they're saying, Hey, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. And so it's really, it's only three ninety nine for the whole three months to start. Oh, thank you for, for uh, offering that to the golf smarter community. Um, and it's probably a great program to do in the winter months, especially if you're not in a 12 month a year golf area. Um, because four fifty over or three ninety nine, definitely three ninety nine over twelve weeks is probably what you're going to spend on golf anyway during the summer. So <laughs> do this in the winter, right? Yep. Give this as a gift. This is a great gift. Uh, but still, if you're committed to doing, you know, if you're committed to playing golf for the rest of your life and you want to play and not be frustrated. This is the kind of thing that is really necessary for you to have a healthy, long, healthy golf life. One hundred percent. And golf is hard enough. I think we all know that. There's then our goal is just to make sure that <laughs> the body is not a question mark when you're on the golf course. That you know your body can do everything that you need it to do, and um, you know golf doesn't need to be any harder. <laughs> so yeah, um, right. So. Well, it, it's par for success number four. Par for success dot com. But really. Uh, go into the show notes from today's episode uh, or our blog post at golfsmarter.com and we have a specific link there so that you can get the Golf Smarter discount. Um, if you just click on that, you don't have to put in Golf Smarter. And if you're not seeing that you're getting the discount, just reach out. Uh, definitely just reach out. Reach out to Chris. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, they'll make sure that you are taken care of. Um Chris, it was great to talk to you again, man. Thanks so much. Likewise, Chris. Um, and thanks for making sure that I'm not exploding. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad we could clear that up. I, yeah, thank you. I'm going to go take a walk. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, again, thanks so much. You're doing some great work, and I really appreciate it. And thanks for reaching out and talking to me again today. Thanks for having me, Fred. Pleasure as always, man. So how would you like to get a free golf physical assessment and customized golf exercise program. Well, thanks to the generosity of Par for Success, 
That's our next Golf Smarter giveaway for 2020. We're giving away a full assessment and custom design exercise program, and the registration is now open. Deadline to enter to win is midnight Pacific time, 3 a.m. Eastern on Sunday, September 20, 20. <laughs> September 20th, 2020. That's 9 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Okay. To enter, go to golfsmarter.com and click on the Enter Now banner at the top of the page. Also, if you'd like to take advantage of that $50 Golf Smarter discount, then click on the link for Par for Success when you register. But you probably would like to know if you're the winner of the full access pass to the Consistent Golf Summit. Well, if you live in Rosslyn, British Columbia, Canada, and you're a Golf Smarter listener, and your name is Gwen Campbell, then yes, you won. Congratulations, Gwen. And no, we're not going to make any Glenn jokes. I'll be sending you an email and copying Bo Watson on it so that you can get your package delivered ASAP. Now, the Consistent Golf Summit is still available for purchase, and you can find the link in today's show notes or on the giveaway page at golfsmarter.com. The Consistent Golf Summit featured 18 world-class experts who reveal their secrets on how to build a consistent golf swing from scratch. And that package includes unlimited access to 20 masterclass video sessions, transcripts to all of those sessions, plus 15 hours of the audio of these master class sessions so you can take them with you wherever you go and there's so much more that goes into that package so look into that now based on your suggestions we've got some pretty new and interesting products to introduce you to coming up soon have you heard of shot scope their newest iteration v3 has been released and we're going to talk to gavin deer about shot scope with all its gps and performance tracking abilities I'm very excited to try mine out. I just received it, and the timing is perfect because my GPS just died. So I'll let you know how that goes. But um, also, uh, next week, we're going to talk to a club fitter about why even beginners should get fitted before making any club purchases. And then we're going to get a chance to speak to the CEO of Lab Golf to talk about their directed force putters. The DF2 is the putter that you maybe saw Adam Scott using once on the tour. I think he even won with it. This is an incredible technology that I can't wait to learn more about. I've been obsessing on those YouTube videos, uh, and I advise you, if you've not heard of Lab Golf uh, or the DF2 or the Directed Force Putters, look them up on YouTube and stay tuned for that episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for products or guests, please, I want to hear about them. Use at Golf Smarter on social media or just click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com. <laughs>